Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Backyard Farmer. We've got another great program for you tonight, which of course includes answering your gardening questions. You can reach us by phone, just dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Toll free number is 800-676-5446. Emailed questions and those JPEG picture attachments, send those to byf at unl.edu. We do answer those on future shows. We also need to know as much information about your problem as you can give us, including which county you live in or what part of the state you live in. Backyard Farmer is also available during the week on our social media network. That includes Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So to start tonight, Jody Green has the very first sample of some bumblies. I do. So I've got some awesome pollinators here. Um, these are all not the same insect, but we've been getting a lot of calls. People have been saying that they are being attacked by bumblebees. So what they are are carpenter bees. They look very similar, isn't that? They're hairy, you might want to hug them. <laughs> They're distributing pollen, oh, no. and uh, they, they, they're, they're flying around right now, so both of them. But the difference is that carpenter ants, their habitat is that they nest in wood. And so they're flying under people's decks. They are leaving uh, sawdust around and also yellow staining on uh, furniture or walls. And you can see the difference between them. The carpenter bees are on this side and they've got very shiny butts. Um, whereas a bumblebee will have a very hairy butt. Um, the females are pretty busy, so they're not interested or um, aggressive. They do have a stinger, but they're not aggressive. So the males, though, are territorial. They're kind of aggressive. The more you wave at them and try to kill them, the more they're going to come after you. But they don't have a stinger. And I'm sure you don't have time to find out if it's a male or female. So right now, you either just leave them alone because they're great pollinators, or you can take a fly swatter to them, or you could catch them and freeze them to kill them. Um, if they won't cause a lot of structural damage, but if there's a lot of nesting and you want to get rid of those those uh, females in there, um, you can dust with a in uh, residual insecticide, call it professional, that would probably be a little bit better. But um, what she's doing is drilling holes in there to make a, a tunnel, and in those chambers that she's making, she's laying eggs and provisioning it with pollen balls. So they, adults will emerge in the late summer and over winter. So you will want to seal those holes up before the winter to keep them from overwintering there. All right, awesome. Sorry, long story. So if it story. chases you, you think it's a female? And no, if it's chasing male, you, it's a male. You it's say bluffing. whatever? It's bluffing. <laughs> All right. Bluffing. <laughs> All right, Bill. All right. Now we have... So I, was, I feel like it feels like an eternity of spring irrigation repairs at my house lately. And so I thought, well, it's getting dry out, and so this would probably be a good time to talk about some basic do-it-yourself uh, repairs you can do to your home irrigation system <clears throat> to make sure that it's not... Um, you know, watering the street, or there's a head that's blowing and you know, geyser in your front yard. And so uh, it's pretty simple to fix some of these. If it's too complicated for you, always uh, call up a professional irrigation uh, installer, make sure they're certified. Um, and uh, there's just a couple things I wanted to show. There's two different types of uh, heads. Um, this is a rotor head. Uh, if you've seen these, they kind of spin around in 360s. Uh, and then we have the pop-up heads. And uh, they're very different in how they work. These rotor heads, although they put a big stream of water out, uh, they put down a lot less water than the, the, uh, the pop-up heads. So if you're mixing and matching heads, make sure that the zone that has all the rotors, you don't put a pop-up on because you're going to flood that area, or vice versa. You don't want to put a rotor onto a, a pop-up head because it's going to not put enough water out. Um, be, be careful to, uh, to open them up. Uh, and make sure that you have the arc set properly and you can just a little screw on top of most of these that you can adjust so that the, um, it's not throwing too far, it's not throwing too short. You want to kind of dial that in and make sure it's not spinning and going into the street. And if you see water coming from the top, there's a gasket inside, it's probably broken. So that's best just to replace these. And when you unscrew them from the ground, you'll generally find a big, long riser like this. If it's too long for you, you can cut them to various lengths, and then you just want to screw it in and adjust your arcs. And so uh, it's not a really difficult thing to do, but I really want to make sure you optimize your irrigation system, especially as we're heading towards uh, this hot, hot, dry period that we're in. But, you know, and if you have an irrigation system, don't overuse it. Uh, they're way too overused. I still haven't watered my front yard. You know, it's been dry, but the grass is going to be just fine. All right, awesome, Bill, thanks. Okay, Kyle Broderick, first 
maiden appearance and first sample. Uh, so today I brought in uh, powdery mildew of lilacs. It's a pretty common disease, this uh, pretty common fungal disease that, that's popping up this time of year. Uh, and really it's not one that you have to worry too much about. Um, but on the lower, the lower parts of the lower leaves of the plants, we'll just start to have this kind of white powdery growth on the upper side of the leaves that you can rub away with your fingers. And that growth is actually the fungal mycelium or the fungal spores that you can see on there. And again, like I said, this is lilac, but there's a, powdery, there's, there's a type of powdery mildew that really affects pretty much every shrub or hardwood that's out there. As far as control, um, if it is a pretty, if, if it's a high value specimen, you may want to consider using a fungicide um, or even a sulfur type spray. But in general, we don't need to control this, um, this fungus in Nebraska. And once the weather kind of cools down a little bit, we should just start to see a lot less of this disease around as well. Perfect, and I think the lilacs on East Campus have powdery mildew. That's where this year. came from. <laughs> but of course, we love to teach with what we've got, right? Indeed. All right, thanks, Kyle. Kelly, okay. beautiful little perennial. I do, well, I have a perennial here that Kim tells me has not been on Backyard Farmer yet. And it's Lady's Mantle <clears throat> is the common name, or an Elkamila mollus. I, mm -hmm. I always look at Kim, because um, working with the general audience, I try not to use scientific names too often. And Kim <laughs> teaches it. So anyway, this is right now, it's in full bloom, and it kind of has these chartreuse, tiny flowers. Um, I guess just standing here holding this, it may not look that ornamental, but if you plant these in a mass, um, it just, it, right now in my yard, they just look kind of frothy, they're very fine textured, and they will last for about one month. Uh, and then after that, they do brown out, and you know, you, typically it's best if you deadhead those and prune out those uh, flowering stalks. And then the rest of the year, that plant will look beautiful. The foliage, it has kind of a unique shaped leaf, and it's very fuzzy. And so a unique characteristic of this is after you irrigate or after it rains, it's always covered with water droplets that kind of reflect uh, what else is around your you know, around these plants. It's best to grow it, um, I find it works best in part shade. Mm -hmm. It'll say that it'll grow in full sun, but the leaves tend to brown out in full sun in Nebraska. And it'll even tolerate pretty heavy shade, but it won't bloom as well. So part shade, mine right now have full east sun and they're blooming profusely. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a drought tolerant plant, although I don't water mine very much. I'm kind of like Bill, uh, but my leaves do brown out a little bit. So probably medium water, um, but it, once it gets established, it's pretty tough too. It's pretty low water using. All right, excellent. And that is a very nice plant. It's probably underutilized in the landscape. I think so. Great as a mass plant. You bet. All right, Jody, first picture is yours. Uh, and this is in, uh, found this insect in a garden in North Lincoln. So we have a picture of, and, and that's great that that viewer put a, uh, a little coin yes, in there to give us the fantastic. scale. Yes, thank you for the scale. So that looks like, um, it's a tiger beetle and they're beautiful. Actually, this one is called a six spotted tiger beetle, even though it has no spots, but that's <laughs> what happens in Nebraska. We are six spotted, it's a no spotted six spotted tiger beetle. <laughs> they have giant eyes, their heads are wider than their thorax, and they've got these amazing long running legs, which I wish I had. <laughs> but they are predators, natural enemies of the garden, so they're gonna take care of your caterpillar pests, um, spiders, they could take care of um, ants and grasshoppers. So, you know, it would be nice to, to have that one living in any garden, so that would be great. I would say just enjoy it. All right, wonderful and a beautiful green color. Yeah, it's too bad that one's dead. <laughs> <laughs> so morbid. Yes, I know, it's so beautiful, so dead. All right, uh, Bill, this is, uh, this is a very loyal viewer in Omaha. Okay. Uh, this grass was in a pot with a native plant. Okay. And he thought it was really cute, but it's already seeding itself. He wants to know, is it a bonus to treasure or a bane? Yeah, we think it's a bane, uh, actually probably an invasive bane. That would, uh, we're thinking that's reed canary grass, which is uh, something I battled a lot during my internships uh, uh, in college uh, in the native areas of golf courses. It's, it's um, really, really profuse. It spreads with rhizomes, and so it will just take over an area. So if, if it's in a, a pot like that, you want to get rid of it and uh, rogue it out as fast as possible. 
Um, there's some things you can do in native areas, but it's a real tough uh, grass to control in native areas or in your bed. So you want to get that under control uh, immediately before the rhizome starts to spread throughout your garden. All right, excellent. Thanks, Bill. Kyle, this is the first picture we've had of this for the entire season, and it's a way cool one. Exciting. Yes, and this is in the Benson area, mulched area. I did not see this crazy yellow mass. Thought it came out in an hour or two. It oozed. Um, she thinks it's, she, she wants to know what it is and is it safe? Uh, yes, it's quite safe actually. Um, looks to me like just a beautiful, beautiful slime mold. Um, and they are fairly common, um, really nothing to worry about. They feed on, um, feed on just uh, decaying vegetation. <coughs> if they're close to your garden, you don't need to worry about the, um, about the slime mold moving into your garden or anything like that. I have some in my yard and I just let them be. Um, but if you are worried about it, you can always just take a hose and spray it down if you would like. Um, and that, that should get rid of it. Another way to get rid of it if you really want to is you can just take a, a plastic bag and scoop it up along with the, uh, the, the decaying material that it's feeding on and then just scoop, that ba uh, scoop the material up in the bag and dispose of it that way. But otherwise I would probably leave it. Which is a perfect, uh way to get rid of it because we're talking about what else you use those bags for if you have dogs. <laughs> Great Danes. <laughs> Challenge. You, you need a garbage bag yeah. for them. All right, Kelly, you have two pictures from two different viewers that are sort of related issues. The first is uh, a Dunstan chestnuts, which is a wonderful chestnut tree near Garland. Uh, he's got one that is looking like this compared okay. to the other two. And um, he did fertilize, no change in color occurred. And then the second one is a viewer who is out in Elma in Harlan County. Mm -hmm. Weeping willows, they're only five years old, two are close together. And then the third one is uh, kind of looking like that on the left. So what, what do we want to say about these two okay. sets of pictures here? Well, the chestnut one, they, they sent a close-up picture of the leaf, and that is always very helpful, and it clearly is chlorosis. Whenever you have those yellowing leaves with the dark green veins, <coughs> and that isn't chlorosis, most likely iron chlorosis. Sometimes with maples, it's manganese, so I'm not sure which one chestnut gets, but I would guess iron chlorosis. And it's not unusual in the same yard to have one, two, you know, two of the same plants, and one looks perfectly fine, and the other one is chlorotic. Um, it may be that, that the one that is chlorotic was planted in an alkali pocket. Maybe the soil is just a little higher pH there. Um, sometimes it's, it can be compounded by things like compaction. Um, if, if that's an area where water drains to then, and it stays wet really long, those are the things that can compound it. Now, I know he said he applied iron to it, and it didn't uh, have it make any difference. I'm going to refer you to, if you go to the Nebraska Forest Service website, to Google that and then click on publications, they have uh, a publication, a pamphlet on treating iron chlorosis in eastern Nebraska as well as western Nebraska. And there's some good pointers in there. There's some like chelated iron, there's certain different forms and some will work better in eastern Nebraska than western. So you might want to check that out, follow those instructions and see if that helps. Um, otherwise, try to improve the growing condition there, maybe using mulch, something like that. And the willow, the willow could be iron chlorosis too, but we don't have a close-up of the picture. So look at those leaves, or, or a close-up of the leaves. Look at those leaves, and if the veins are darker green, then it probably is a chlorosis too. But I zoomed in on the picture, and one of the stems has some cracky, long, long cracks in it, so there could be a canker disease on the trunk, on those branches or trunk. The base of it looked like there might have been some damage, maybe from lawnmower or something. And so that can also cause an injury that will restrict, that, restrict the uptake of that nutrient. So, you know, you might want to, I notice there's a little bit of mulch around the base. You might want to increase that mulch area, mulch ring, and make sure it isn't getting overwatered or kind of hard to overwater a willow. But in a heavy clay soil, it could be. All right. And hopefully Thanks, it'll Kelly. do okay. All right. Thanks. You know, if you live in an older neighborhood, you may have a very well-established oak or maple or a linden. And of course, these trees offer a lot of beauty and shade for your home, but those roots and that root flare can cause some issues sometimes. A lot of homeowners have come up with really creative ways to deal with the flare and the roots, but there are some effective ways to do that without damaging the roots, the health of the tree, or the lawnmower blades. <laughs>
All the benefits of trees also come with a downside, at least in some people's mind, because you have to deal with the root system. These magnificent oaks are growing exactly the way they should, which is with a big bowl as they get larger or the root flare. But what we get is the questions about what can be done either to hide it or if those roots become surface roots, what can be done actually to cover them up. We're going to be talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and what you can and cannot and should and should not do around the base of your trees. Oaks are one of the tree species that typically does not have surface roots, and you can see what this owner is beginning to do to be able to deal with that flare. They've done it right, they've added just compost around the edges, and now they're starting to add perennials, which hopefully will not need dividing. That way they're not getting into the root system of the tree, they haven't raised the grade around it, and ultimately they will be able to mask or hide that flare if they don't like the way it looks. Unlike oaks, maples are notorious for their surface roots. That's particularly true in terrible construction soils or soils that are poorly drained. This is a great example of what happens. The ideal situation here will be not to put in a wall, certainly not to fill over those roots, maybe top dress a little bit with some compost, but then put down mulch that will cover those roots. If you want to, you can go ahead and add a ground cover to it that again will spread by itself and not need dividing. But a good example of what still happens is as the maple gets bigger, the roots get bigger. One of the things that you can do is expand that mulch bed. You're still likely to find surface roots way out into the turf. If that happens and you have enough light, you can still potentially get that turf to look okay. Then you're going to have to worry a little bit about scalping those roots with the blades of the mower because those are perfect spots for all of those good rots and spots to begin to get into the root system and deteriorate the tree. We see a lot of this kind of construction around the roots of trees, which is to put in a small retaining wall, put soil against the trunk of the tree, and then put plants in it. Unfortunately, that is not the best solution. Remember that the roots of the tree are going to spread out and you can see what happens over time. You're, you put soil against the trunk. We have all sorts of critters that can make that their home. This part of the root system is actually being smothered because the roots of trees are typically within the top 24 inches of the soil. And in an attempt to continue to grow, of course, these roots have come out from under the wall so you really haven't resolved the problem of what to do about the root system. The ideal situation, and this is one that this homeowner has actually agreed to do, is to pull this retaining wall out, take the plants out, feather that soil back down so it is no longer touching the trunk, go ahead and put these ground cover plants back in the ground where they belong, don't grow the turf in the shade of this big beautiful linden, and everybody is going to be happier. The tree, the plants, and the homeowner. You know, sometimes the simple things like good compost and mulch that's not a volcano are the best things for your trees. It can really be tempting to build up that soil and those walls and create a little garden under the trees, but you don't want to take it too far and end up damaging the root system and putting soil against the trunk for all of Jody's luscious insects. Speaking of luscious, this is just great. Is, <laughs> I love the way our viewers are describing things. This is a Syracuse viewer. She found this hole approximately an inch and a half, she's saying, uh, surrounded by solid web-like material in her strawberry bed, and she wonders what, lur what is lurking. Hmm, well, um, I don't know if it, an inch and a half is pretty big. That, I would say, I've had one of those. If it's about the size of a quarter, it could be um, like a nice burrowing wolf spider, which is very exciting because that means it's taking care of the pests in your strawberry garden. Um, I would say not to worry too much about it. Uh, if you want to find out for sure, I would get a little watering can and put some water down the hole and see what jumps out. <laughs> um, the venom will not be harmful to you and it will probably not want to be with you anyway. You can fill up that hole and move it. I don't think there's any rules about relocating spiders, um, but you can also um, just let it be. All right, thanks Jody. All right, Bill, we've had this, this particular weed before, mm -hmm. uh, but this is a viewer um, 
with an acreage and she said she thinks rock said it's a weed that propagates if even a tiny little piece of it lies on the ground what is it uh, she's wondering if she can just leave it lie to dry out or will it rejuvenate itself yeah not this one personally it's a summer annual and it likes the uh it can handle the heat and dry mm -hmm. it's kind of you know it's kind of, almost kind of like a cactus so if you put it there it's just going to sit there it's going to hang out that's what rock was talking about where it uh, uh, if you just leave it most likely it's going to survive in some form and continue to grow or, or whatever it's just, it is a summer annual so it's not going to overwinter so uh, but it will continue to grow and fill in that area if you want to uh um, if you want to control it, you could pull it, get rid of it. Um, herbicides with triclopure or um, uh, dicamba will work to control it, and um, your pre-emergence won't. So the only one that works is the gallery, and that controls broadleaves. So the pre-emergent you might use for crabgrass is not going to help for this. And again, if it's in a lawn, th this is something you see in lawns that are poorly maintained, and so that's a good indication that you have some bigger fundamental issues with your lawn. So. All right. Or you have cracks in your brick sidewalk. Yeah, that's why I get them. <laughs> Me too. Between all the flagstones and the fire pit. <laughs> okay, Kyle, this is East Campus Neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Wichita blue juniper, which it's a Rocky Mountain juniper, which starts us out thinking, wait a minute, this is not the Rocky Mountains. Uh, only four years old. They, they cut down the stem, and then it's great for them to show this picture. Uh, they're wondering, is, is, is there a disease of junipers that would affect this and should they go ahead and take it out and start over and maybe not with the same one? Um, I don't necessarily think that that is a disease um, that's causing, causing the issue. The dark, um, dark spot in the center of the stem is probably just the heartwood. Uh, junipers tend to have a lot darker heartwood, um, tends to have a, red, a reddish color. And what I would recommend doing is just kind of following that dead, uh, that dead leader down and see if there's not some sort of injury as you go further down, the, uh, further down the stem. Maybe a canker or there could have been an animal feeding on it that just caused the stem to girdle and ended up killing that, killing that top portion of the plant. As far as planting something else in that area, I think you easily could go ahead and just plant, uh, if you want to plant another juniper in that area, it might do just fine. Another option would be potentially even uh, just to train a new leader out of that one. If it is just the, if you are able to find a, a wound or some sort of um, animal feeding and prune that out and then just try to train a new leader and have that same plant going. All right, excellent, thanks Kyle. <clears throat> okay, mm -hmm. Kelly, we got two different people sent us pictures of the same plant. Mm -hmm. uh, one is in a gravel road ditch, Northwest Iowa, and it was in flower a week ago. And the other one is actually South Omaha. Mm -hmm. in a lot of vacant areas, sidewalk gaps. Okay. What do we have here? Okay. This is wild for four o'clock. Um, and it, it's, a, it's, it's native uh, to our area, to North America, this particular one anyway, it has purple flowers. It's a good pollinator plant. The bees, bees like it. Um, hummingbirds might go after it, some moths like it. So I, it's not really a problem one. I wouldn't worry about trying to control it. And, but there is, there is one that's related to it. Uh, we have a garden four o'clock and that's actually native to Peru, not here. So, and Mirabilis is the genus for this. And I think the wild one is Nicotogenia or something like that. And, but anyway, the, the one is, is Marvel of Peru is what it's <coughs> called. And it comes in a variety of colors. There's red, there's pink, there's white, there's even a yellow one. And that is one that you can grow in your own garden as an annual. Um, it's not hardy to Nebraska, but it's a great pollinator plant and it's drought tolerant. So consider growing that one. All right, thank you, Kelly. You know, we are really proud of how our garden has taken off since everything was planted a few weeks ago. We even had enough produce to start donating to a local charity. Let's take a minute to hear from Extension Educator Terry James from the Backyard Farmer Garden. in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're going to talk about two projects that you can actually participate with us in. The first one is Grow a Row. We're going to challenge you to see how much produce you can bring on Tuesday nights versus how much we grow in the Backyard Farmer Garden. This produce will all get donated to Produce from the Heart, who will then take it to the local food banks and pantries in the East Campus area. Great project. 
We did our first collection last week, Tuesday, and we came up with 41 pounds of produce. So can you beat that next Tuesday? Join us at our Master Gardeners in the Garden on Tuesday nights from 4.30 to 6.30 and bring your extra produce. We're also gonna ask you to join us this Saturday, June 10th in the Backyard Farmer Garden from nine to one. We are gonna be a stop on the Lincoln Garden Club Tour. Master Gardeners are gonna be here along with some of the panel members to help answer all of your gardening questions and come see how great the Backyard Farmer Garden is looking this week. We'll keep you updated on the running total of our donated produce this year. And this is really a great program. We hope it'll inspire you to grow a row to help those who need that fruit and vegetable get them from some other place. So it's pretty cool. Lots of pounds. All right, Jody, just a question. <laughs> this came um, from north, north of Nebraska City in Oto County. 20-year-old oak, the leaves are curling. They're not saying up or down, but have, have you seen this and what do you think is going on here? Well, I know there is a lot of um, herbicide drift, but I've also seen a lot of aphid damage. Mm -hmm. So it could be that. I know with a 20-year-old tree, you probably won't get to see the leaves close enough to find out. But if it is aphid damage, you could try to spray it with some water, but um, it shouldn't really kill the tree. Okay, and we've seen shiny. You see the shiny stuff. You'll see the honeydew. Yes. <laughs> All righty, Bill. A uh, Lincoln viewer wants to know how to remove quack grass now. Ooh, quack grass. You know, there's a new um, herbicide option out there. We talked about the glove of death, but now there's actually um, like, a, like a deodorant stick. What? Yes, and you can <laughs> rub it on your plants. So you don't have to get the glove of death on anymore. So that might be something. You're not going to be able to selectively control quack grass, unfortunately. Uh, nothing's labeled for lawns um, from a herbicide perspective. Uh, so it's going to be non-selective, and you know maybe you try something like that. Again, it's going to be rhizomatous, so pulling it is just going to make it mad and make it worse. So you're going to need to do something non-selective to, to control that guy. Okay, so we move from glove of death to deodorizing our weeds. It's a little safer. <laughs> Just it smells good. Okay. <laughs> Don't recommend that. Kyle, this is a Lincoln viewer. Mm -hmm. They say they have uh, fungus in their bluegrass. They use spectricide to treat it. He's had it before. He knows it's a fungal infection. Is that something that works with it? And then the follow-up is fertilizing it. So d does the fungicide work now? Um, I am not entirely sure about the fungicide bill. Yeah, I mean, do you have? I think it really depends on what the fungi they're trying to control is mm -hmm. and the pressure that they're putting on it. Is it being overwatered? Um, is it lean? A lot of times people think you don't fertilize now because it's warm, and that's not exactly true. If the grass looks yellow, it's not because of lack of water. It's because of lack of fertilizer. And so we had some research last year that where we didn't fertilize and it looked yellow and hot, it died. If we fertilized it, it looks fine. So if the grass looks a little yellow, the fertilizer should help to increase the plant's health. But in terms of the actual uh, fungi causing that problem, I think you send a sample in, figure out what it yep. is, then we'll figure out an effective way to try to manage that. But there's just too many fungi diseases out there that could be causing this problem. Exactly, yeah. There's Excellent. quite a few of them. Thanks, guys. Uh, Kelly, this is a viewer with a 35-year-old Canada red cherry in Norfolk mm -hmm. and basically a, a crack halfway down the trunk. Doesn't sound good. Is it a goner? Time to start mm -hmm. over? It may not be a goner yet, but uh, it's probably on its way out. So a lot of times we talk about trees that are dead, but they just don't know it yet. <laughs> um, so that sounds like one that you'll want to replace. All right. Excellent opportunity for a new plant. Yes. You know, <laughs> all right. Kelly, are you ready? I'm ready. So, a person doesn't want to use cans because of the lining that maybe has BPA in it for protecting their tomato stems. What else could she use around her tomatoes? Okay, well, if you're trying to protect them from cutworms, we recommend toilet paper tubes. Perfect. We have a viewer with a catalpa that has three main trunks. Mm -hmm. Can she prune two of them off part way, do a reduction to, yeah. to do a liter? If it's young enough, um, Yes, go ahead and do that. The sooner it's done, the better. You don't want those triple liters in this case. All right. Should you pinch the spent flowers, just the flower itself, out of a petunia or take that whole end thing off? What's better? Well, it, I, I deadhead. Just pinch out the spent flower itself. Some petunias, eventually, they get so ragged that you do kind of want to shear them back. But that would be later in the season. 
Okay, we have a York viewer who wants to know when they should stop harvesting their asparagus and let it go to seed. <laughs> well, when the spears are about the size of a pencil, they're getting smaller and about the size of a pencil, that's telling you I need some foliage to photosynthesize, so stop harvesting. All right, is it too late to pinch the candles on the pines for pruning? I don't believe so, but if, if they've completely opened and unfurled, it's probably getting a little late, but if they're still in the candle stage, go ahead and pinch. Awesome, excellent job, Kelly. Okay, Kyle, first lightning round. <sighs> Pressure's <Me> on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a viewer in Brownville who had a cottonwood that was removed four years ago. They still have shrooms coming up in the lawn in that spot. How long can they expect this? Uh, probably as long as there will be uh, decaying wood underneath the soil. So it may, it may take a little while. <laughs> or a long time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do diseases of agronomic crops like soybeans affect the same crop in the gardens? Uh, they, they certainly can. Um, I know if you, had, if you are out in a soybean field and then you have dry beans or something like that that you're growing in your garden, some of those, uh, some of those diseases can cross and affect, yes. Okay. We have a viewer who said the lettuce looks fine outside, but then inside there's this mushy, icky, brownie stuff. Any idea on that? Uh, that might be fusarium wilt. Um, that's a soil-borne fungal disease, and really just prune it out, or rogue it out. Okay. How do you know if you have virus-free seed for plants? Um, I would look on the package of, on which you bought the seed and just hope that you're buying certified virus-free seed. Okay. Can a, a soil test, a simple one, show the presence of pathogen in the soil? Uh, certain pathogens, if you have any nematode issues, a, a soil test will do that, but for other ones, we actually do need the whole plant. Perfect, nice job, first time <laughs> around. See, that's not so bad. Not you too get bad, struck no. by that lightning. <laughs> <clears throat> All righty, uh, Bill, you're up next. Okay. We have a husband-wife debate. Oh, my favorite. <laughs> One wants to water one spot for three to four hours. The other wants to water the same spot all day before moving the movable sprinklers. Um, it depends on the sprinkler. If you have one of those sprinklers that kind of goes back and forth with the high water, it could take a long time to get enough water down versus one that just sprays water into a small area. So the better thing to do would be to put a little tuna can or something out there. When you get about an inch of water down uh, or you start to see water running off if it's sloped, that's when it's enough is enough. Okay. Will lightly misting new turf help this weekend with tennis? No, don't. Okay. Unless, okay. If it's sod, maybe. But if, you, if, it's, <laughs> if it's grass, don't miss. It just promotes disease. All right. What is the best control for annual weeds in turf and landscapes right now? Mowing. Perfect. Frequently. So any advice, which you kind of mentioned, on turf that's yellow, right? It's yellow. Uh, if it's yellow now, uh, it's nitrogen. But if you're... If, if you, if you have bluegrass, it normally goes yellow in the middle of summer from iron chlorosis. Thinking about getting some iron down would be good, uh, iron sulfate, water it in. Maybe not do it this weekend with the heat, wait for it to cool off a little bit. Nice job. Not much lightning, but nice job anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jody, you ready? Sure. Uh, so we have a viewer who says they are having a black ant hatch and they want to eliminate. Mm. Well, what you might be seeing is pavement ant wars. So that happens when there's just, it looks like there's little black dots just spilling over. They're just ants having a territorial fight. So Nothing if it's outside. Just leave it, okay? They'll Light kill each other. <laughs> Lightning bugs are out June 4th in David City. Is that early? No, I've seen some. I saw, I've had some people tweet me. I've mm -hmm. seen some, uh, some lightning bugs, but I haven't seen a lot of flashing. I haven't been flashed, but I've seen them. They're out. <laughs> All right. Uh, we have a, a viewer who wants to know if they can use a pyrethrin dust on squash and melons for vine borers. Um, I would just cut them out. Okay. Hardly any butterflies yet. Why? Some. I've seen some skippers. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, I've seen a lot of caterpillars, so they're coming. All right. When should you start looking for box elder bugs so that they don't invade your house? Um, well, I've heard they're already out. They've hatched on some of the maple trees and box elder trees. But when you want to get rid of them in your house, it's the fall is what they're getting in. Perfect. Very nice job. I was all. a loser today. <laughs> <laughs> you gave very good answers, though. Yeah, very thorough. <laughs> okay, Kelly, plant of the week is okay, up Okay, that's right. 
Okay. And this is wonderful plant. because, mm -hmm. you know, we always honor Gladys with our odd things That's from right. the garden. This but this happens to be our very own cameraman who brought these oh, in. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> it's a wonderful combination of colors, too. You know, purple and orange, a little bit of yellow, some white. Um, anyway, as most people probably maybe recognize, this is Jackman Eye Clematis. Um, or maybe mailbox plant, because that's where we often see it growing. It is a vine. It's probably one of our most popular and one of our toughest clematis, and these bloom profusely. A lot of people will prune them back by half or even more, but it seems like they bloom whether you do that or not. Uh, but so Jackmanite clematis, it is a vine. Um, and then we have an Asiatic lily here, and these are a tough plant that grows from a large bulb that's planted in the spring. Um, it's not a fall planted bulb and just tall single spike, beautiful orange color. There's so many Asiatic lilies, they just, but this is a very beautiful one. And then of course, uh, Shasta daisy. And Shasta daisy is one of those plants that you either love it or you don't like it because they do tend to reseed and spread in the perennial garden, but they're fairly easy to rogue out. <clears throat> Um, so if you know if there's more than you want, you can either share them with friends or you can rogue them out. There is one called Becky that I know my master gardeners love, and that one doesn't seem to spread quite as nicely. So beautiful, cameraman, beautiful. Thanks for bringing them. <laughs> and a great combination, that mm -hmm. color wheel thing going on. Okay, Jody, you get the next picture question. And again, this is, this is a great description. This is a Marquette viewer. She saw this wee beastie enjoying her salvia. Uh, she says it looks like part bumblebee, part hummingbird moth. And you can just see him there on that salvia. She wonders what it is, good guy, bad guy, or somewhere in between. Um, in this phase, it's a, it's a good guy. And I love your description as well, because it does look like a bumblebee because it's got those two yellow stripes. And um, it does appear to be kind of hummingbird-like because it, it hovers, but they do have this robust body. As an adult, they feed on nectar, they're daytime flying moths, and they also fly at dusk. Um, very pretty. As larvae, though, they are of the um, hornworms, mm -hmm. so they've got a horn on their butt, <laughs> and they are hairless or naked, <laughs> and they're not very good for plants, so they, um, they will feed on plants, this one especially um, grapes. So On grapes, so it's not our good old tomato yeah. hornworm. But in this phase, enjoy it. Perfect. All right, Bill, uh, our very first picture of this particular yeah. weed, yep. uh, West mm -hmm. Omaha, we've gotten some questions about it, but what is it, how to remove, he's been pulling, yeah. but they keep growing back. Yep, so that is a nutsedge, it's something that we are studying really actively here at, um, in, in our turf program. If you grab it, you'll know it's not a grass because if you run it through your fingers, you'll feel it's triangular, it's not round or folded over. So if you run it through your fingers, you'll know it's nutsedge. Nutsedge has these little nutlets in the ground that it grows from, so it's a perennial. So if you had it last year pretty bad, you're probably gonna have it bad this year. And it generally starts to emerge this time of year, especially with the heat that we're getting. If it's an area that you can just pull, pull a couple, if they're new, that's fine. Uh, if it's in like a, uh, a bed and you can round it up or something like that, that would be um, ideal. Um, it's going to be tough to do um, if it's in a lawn because it's just intermixed with the grass. There are some herbicides that work okay, um, uh, sedge hammer, dismiss, things like that, that you can do in earlier applications are the better for that. If you're looking for more information, go to our website, turf.unl.edu, to learn more about control. Perfect. Thank you. All right, Kyle, um, this is a Milligan viewer. He wondered what happened to his cukes and melons in the garden. Um, frost, chemical damage, fungus. He did plant early in cold soil. Um, but what are we seeing here, do you think? Yes. Well, it's kind of difficult to tell from, from this picture. It could be some frost damage on the, on the, um, the lower leaves, but I'm really not entirely sure, um, just based off of the picture. We wouldn't really expect to see any of the um, typical diseases such as anthracnose showing up this early. Um, so yeah, like I, like I said, without knowing more information, it's really hard to, to tell for sure what's going on. Uh, one thing I would recommend though, is you certainly want to thin some of those, uh, those melons and cucumbers out, maybe uh, thin out the less vigorous plants and really make sure that you're spacing them correctly as well, that they're not uh, spaced too closely. And then just general garden, uh, garden health maintenance things such as, um, making sure to avoid overhead irrigation, and if you put down a straw mulch, that certainly helps as well. All right, awesome, thanks, Kyle. 
Okay, Kelly, uh, this is a carny viewer that found what they're calling a berry plant. Okay. Uh, and, you know, compound leaves, are very, these are very small plants, you can't quite tell from the picture, but obviously already in seed, and they wonder what it is. Okay, well, those round seeds, um, oh, I always have a trouble with this astrolagus. Astralagus. 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 I told you I don't <laughs> use the scientific names. Look, Kim teaches it. She uses them all year long, teaching them to students. Thank you, Kim. So I don't know that much about it, um, but that is what it is. So if you want to learn more about it, um, you can, can Google it and check it out. Kind of, it's kind kind of a nice plant. little peel mm -hmm. flowers. Yeah. It is native, yeah. so that's a good thing mm -hmm. for that one. Thanks. All righty. So we, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk kind of fun stuff here for this <laughs> next segment. And this is about Memorial Stadium, which is where Big Red plays. It's really nothing but concrete and steel, right? Wrong. Around the grounds, there are several planting beds that are filled with some really great ornamentals to welcome those fans who visit. Recently, Jeff Culbertson and his crew did a little planting. That's the focus of our second feature tonight. <music> Well, we're here on the north side of Memorial Stadium. It's a lovely summer morning. We're looking at an area here that we renovated last year. We added some new chokeberry, and we've added some perennial grasses and some perennial flowers. And now we're getting ready to prepare and plant some annuals. So the first thing that we want to do when we come in is add a couple inches of compost. We're going to till this into the area, and you would do this whether it's a perennial bed or an annual flower bed. And adding the compost, especially to our heavier clay soils, will enable the roots to really do their thing, get in there, get themselves well established. You'll be much happier with the performance of your plants. So we'll do that, and then we'll bring in our annuals. And again, we talk about right plant, right place. Uh, same sort of thing here. Talk to your garden center professional to make sure you select a plant that kind of lines up with the amount of maintenance that you want to give it. How much tinkering and, and tender care do you want to give that plant? Is it something you like to come out and fuss with and, and uh, kind of garden with, or is it something that you really want to plant and forget? So that's an important part of this whole component. So the plants that we're going to put into these newly prepared beds will be, uh, we have a mix of red and white vinca that have done very well for us in the past. So again, we're kind of going with the red and white theme here. We're going to do some red and white petunias uh, in this particular location. And then if you're over by the ticket office, we're gonna have some red and white begonias. So it should give, get you into that big red spirit when you come to campus. Once we get the plants planted, uh, we also will add a controlled release fertilizer that will extend throughout the season here. So that way we're not having to fertilize these plants frequently. And again, follow the label on that. There's a lot of different ones out there. And then finally, we'll add a couple inches of mulch. We don't want to mulch it heavy, just a, a light coating of mulch, and then water them as needed. So this first time, we'll give it a good soaking. We'll just monitor it based on kind of the weather conditions. So again, you want to make sure you're not overwatering or underwatering. Giving it the screwdriver test occasionally to make sure the soil is at the right moisture is important. And then as we go through the season, um, we may have to add uh, later in the year a little bit more fertilizer to kind of get us through into early fall. And depending on the length of the season, these annuals should really do their thing well into the first part of October. Those little touches are going to make the stadium and the parking areas much more welcoming atmosphere for visitors. Stay off them, please, when you're going to the football game. And, do, and we do want to say thanks to Jeff and his great staff for showing us how this gets done. It's, it's not an easy task in a big old place like this. Jody, you have something you want to tell our viewers. Yeah, my bad. So I got really excited about that wee beastie. I didn't tell you what it was. It is a Nessus Sphinx moth. Sphinx, there we Sphinx go. Sphinx moth. <laughs> All right, you get the next picture anyway, oh, okay. even though you forgot something. Um, this is a viewer who said they, they get a lot of coleopterans in Omaha, but they haven't seen these guys earlier ever. They want to know what they are and whether they should eliminate them. Well, those look like mating May beetles, very hairy ones, it looks like. Um, these guys are white grubs as Ooh. larvae. So right now is, I think, the time to treat for white grubs, right? A little mm -hmm. early. Soon? Soon, we're really very soon. soon. Yep. Very soon. Yep. But these adults will also um, chew on leaves, so I think that's why um, they were asking. So. Um, 
whatever's labeled, I guess, for Japanese beetles um, for the leaf treatment. Is what they or should. pick them off. <laughs> if the tree's not too big and there <laughs> right. aren't too turn many. The lights, turn the lights down um, you know, at night so they don't, aren't attracted to them. All right, thanks, Jody. Okay, Bill, uh, this is actually out by Milford and the viewer saw an entire field of it and then here is the plant. Mm -hmm. Small yellow flowers in bunches, skinny seed pods. What is this? Oh, mustard. Mm -hmm. It's an annual. Mm -hmm. It's flowers yellow. And it looks like that. Yes, that's what it looks like. <laughs> in fields. It's in the field, you might notice it. Uh, the other thing um, too we're seeing right now is the sweet clover is also starting to flower and it, it is also, it has yellow flowers like that. So it could be one or the other if you're driving along and you see that, then it could be one of those two or maybe some other, but probably one of those two. Okay, and if it's sweet clover, roll your windows down and know that it's going to That's just... not gonna work, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> but it smells so good, even if it doesn't oh, okay. kill the plants. <laughs> Good grief, you guys have a problem. <laughs> okay, all right, Kyle, uh, this is a viewer who has a 15 to 20 year old red oak, eight inches in diameter. He's, he's managed an iron chlorosis problem, but now he's seeing the yellow spots on this particular oak. Any ideas? Um, you know, they, kind of look like uh, the start of gall formation um, mm -hmm. that, that are caused by some insect feeding. Uh, normally, the, if it's a well-established, well, if it's a well healthy tree, normally no control is necessary for, for a lot of these galls. Um, <coughs> yeah, I would just kind of let it, let, it, let it be. Yeah, and it is interesting, isn't it, that some things that look like rots end up being insect stuff yep. to begin with, so we, mm -hmm. it's good to watch first. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kelly, uh, hydrangea question from Omaha. Okay. This is uh, Bobo, which is one of the dwarf um, hydrangeas and glowing embers. They've seen a lot of brown leaves. It looks kind of like they're being eaten, but not really. And then they have one that looks just perfect. And what they're really seeing is the two that are right in front of the sprinkler heads. Oh, so, okay. do we have any advice on this? Short of well, bo Bobo's a pretty tough um, hydrangea, and if they are right, if the only ones showing it are right in front of the sprinkler heads, then it could be just that the sprinkler is hitting it, um, and and causing <coughs> some damage. So I don't know what you can do about that sprinkler head. You know, if it's if it's a lawn irrigation system, you know, like Bill, shut it off and and don't use it until you actually really need to use it, and maybe it'll help those uh, Bobo hydrangea. If it continues to be an issue, you'll probably have to move the plants. All right, and, and prune at the proper times, which Correct. is always an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we have a lot of announcements tonight of really fun things in the gardening world. So let's start with Wildflower Week and uh, check local event listings. We have plantnebraska.org, and I know there are a lot of things going on locally for that particular wonderful week. <clears throat> Excuse me, Garden Club of Lincoln Breakfast and Garden Tour this Saturday, starting at Jane Snyder, and we are one of the stops on that particular uh, garden tour, so we're looking forward to that. Our next announcement is the Plattsmouth Garden Club Garden Walk, Sunday, June 11th, Garfield Park in Plattsmouth. Numbers on the screen for that one. Next announcement is we will be on location Saturday, June 17th in the Backyard Farmer Garden. Uh, we have a number for more information. That'll be a great event to celebrate our 65th birthday. We have the River City Cactus and Succulent Society 32nd Annual Sale Thursday. Uh, again, number on the screen on that one if you're into cactus and succulent sorts of things. And of course, produce from the heart. You can donate every Tuesday through September in our backyard farmer garden. So, oh, and look at there, 41 pounds from our very own garden harvested this week. Uh, and the proceeds do go to pro, uh, produce from the heart. So 41 pounds and it was pretty much all lettuce. That's a, that's a lot of salad, <laughs> but that's just great. All righty. So we are going to questions next with no picks. So you okay. guys are going to have to kind of think a little, mm. maybe. Okay, Jody, the first one here is, okay. When should you spray for bagworms? Uh, they have dried up bags on the cedars and some spruce. They, and they're wondering whether they affect pines, but what, what are we gonna say about yeah, treating for bagworms? They kind of affect everything. If you mm -hmm. have some dried up bags, I would just remove them. Anytime I see bagworm bags, I, I take them down. 
if you're going to spray, you're gonna want to see those little tiny um, caterpillars. They look like tiny dancing cannolis right now if they're out. <laughs> That's what they look like, because they've got little bags on them. But if, depending on where you are in, in Nebraska or wherever, like you wanna make sure you're seeing them so that when you spray, that you will kill them. Because if they are too big or if they haven't hatched yet, then you won't kill them. So um, you want to make sure you can get them before they're like an, a half an inch long. So before they're protected in that bag. Okay, all right, thanks. Here are a couple of buffalo grass questions for you, Bill. Um, the viewer has, he, he says, some patches seem to be producing flowers and some don't. Mm -hmm. And a bee or a fly likes the tiny flowers, so he doesn't want to mow them off, but he wants the turf to look a little more uniform, so, and he wants to plug, so should he be plugging from the flowering or not the flowering? Male, female. Does he want the flowers? Well, he's not, I think he just wants it uniform. Okay, so the flowers are actually male. So their buffalo grass is dioecious. It has both female, uh, has female plants and male plants. So the ones that you don't see the flowers on, <coughs> you dig down deeper, you'll actually see the, the developing burr the, on, on the females. And so if you're not seeing that, if you like the, the no, flower look, you'd want to plug from the females and move them and they'll, they'll kind of spread to their daughter plants. If you like the males, because of, for the pollinator's perspective, uh, then you'd want to, you know, grab the males. Um, what was that question? The plugging. And then just the plugging, yeah. And then the other thing too is, uh, sorry, if the, the problem with it letting it grow too long is if you scalp buffalo grass, it quickly goes away. It doesn't Ooh. handle scalping at all. So it might look good, but if you want a lawn, you gotta mow it. So buffalo grass is low maintenance, not no maintenance. Don't scalp it, let it get six inches high and scalp it down to an inch, it hates it. So don't do that. Okay, awesome, thanks Bill. All right, along our clematis lines, Kyle, we have an Omaha viewer that says, and it is a Jackman clematis, um, three plants in the same vicinity, they get some black leaves on them which I know is something we see. Yeah. Uh, well, there are a few different uh, diseases that clematis can get without seeing the, um, seeing the sample. I can't really, can't really diagnose it. Uh, you are welcome to send a sample into the plant pest diagnostic clinic if you would like. Otherwise, I would just uh, recommend pruning out those, uh, the infected stems or the, the vines that have the infected leaves on them. Yeah, perfect. And, and it's kind of in, in it, clematis do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, this is a Valparaiso uh, viewer. Kelly, mm -hmm. sweet Kate variety spiderwort, and she says it's got yellow leaves. And should what's the cause, and how should it be treated? Okay, the sweet Kate. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, sweet Kate is supposed to have yellow leaves. So um, if you like, if you don't like yellow leaved plants, then you probably selected the wrong spiderwort. Um, yeah. Many, m many of them, most of them do have green leaves, but this is normal in this case. Right, and it's very yellow. <laughs> okay, uh, this is an Antelope County viewer, Jody. Large sugar maple, she saw sticky stuff on the leaves, the things hanging on them, and we've had this question mm -hmm. in pics. What is it and what do they do about it? Aphids. Mm -hmm. And? Spray it with water. Spray them yeah, with water. Yeah, they can't get back on the tree after you sprayed them with water. Big. Awesome, very sad, they can't climb it's the tree. It's really sad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Bill, I'm gonna give you this one because it's a, the Tordon or Roundup question. If we have trees in turf and you try to get rid of the trees and the mm -hmm. turf, do we, do we recommend any other chemicals for doing that? No, we don't really like the, uh, the Tordon because we've talked about this like every week on this show, but it can go from root to the other roots it's touching. Mm -hmm. So it can start going to the trees and shrubs that you like in your landscape. And so it's really, really <clears throat> dangerous. And like Elizabeth said like a month ago, I mean, if you're in a pasture and you want zero trees and shrubs, then maybe that would work. But in landscapes, that, that's not really what we want to do. So um, if it's in the lawn, though, just fr frequent mowing is going to take care of most of the, the suckers and sprouts. So. All right, perfect. Thanks, Bill. Kyle, we only have about 20 seconds, and it's a perfect I'll be easy fast. question <laughs> if I ask it, which is uh, this person's crab apple is already losing its leaves, and they're wondering is it too late to put on a fungicide due to the rust? Yes. Perfect. Good lightning round question. <laughs> Excellent answer. Thank you, viewer, for that very last one.